Berko. And Gail is a faculty researcher at INRIA and also a contributor to the madly popular Cycle Learn project. Yeah. So Gail, give us your 30 second one. Years and stuff about so I, I was born a physicist. I did a PhD in quantum physics and a postdoc, and then I decided I wanted to move to more uh, open fields. So I moved to data processing uh, in neuroscience. All the way through, I've always been very much invested in uh, open source uh, scientific computing. And that's how eventually I, I went on to do an open source uh, machine learning Excellent. toolkit. Fantastic. And um, so this is day two of uh, the Open Data Science Conference. We're here on a Sunday. Um, you talked yesterday. How's your experience been so far? I think it's been awesome. I really like the conference. I think it's, it's both laid back but focused. Uh, I think people are here to learn. That's, that's really when I talk to people, that's, that's what I discover. So I think that's great. Excellent. And, um, your talk yesterday was titled uh, Second Learn for Easy Machine Learning, the Vision, the Tool, and the Project. Can you tell us um, something about your talk yesterday, how it went, how the reception was, everything? I think the reception was good talking to people. Yeah, definitely. We got some great feedback about it. So very well done on that. Great, great. Well, I'm very happy about yeah. this. Uh, this was not a technical talk. This was more a high-level talk uh, because uh, the older I get, the more experience I have. But the more I worry about uh, setting the goals right for a project and making sure that uh, uh, the, the right decision and the right people work together, I think that's key to, to success. So uh, a lot of this talk was um, uh, focused on what the, the goals were and how we work together. Oh, very, very good. And um, so tell us about how did you get involved in that segment? So in, I think it was in 2009, uh, we had a discussion in my group with my boss on the state of machine learning in Python. And we were not completely happy with the different options. So after evaluating them, we decided to take the risk of starting something new, of hiring somebody to work on a new project. This was clearly a risk because you know other people had been working on this and these people were clever. So we just decided to put yeah. goals in a different way and it turned out that it worked. No, it's great because um, as I said in my opening remarks, it's, it's, it's a madly popular uh, project. And um, but very interesting, um, you know, it's a big project, a lot of people using it, a lot of contributors. How do you guys manage it? It's, it's really hard to manage. You have so many people between you know, 50 and 400, depending on how you count. Uh, so partly it's very much what we call a doer crossing. Basically the people who do, who get the job yeah. done, get decision power. So basically you come in and uh, you, you do the work, of course, in a certain, in a certain framework. We have guidelines for this. Uh, and progressively, you, you get a reputation and you, you move up the ladder in terms of, uh, of governance. But we also have now two people who are full-time on the project who really work on, on both steering the project and making sure that the information gets shared, that the code gets reviewed well. Uh, so that's also very important. Excellent. Excellent. I love that term, Joe Cross. Do, uh, do a crossing. Do a crossing, yeah. The bar of yeah. so That's very good. Um, so, have you been blown away by the uh, success of Cycle Learn? Absolutely. I never thought it would go that far. It's why do you Why do you think that is? Like, what's What's some of the Behind that. Well, part of it was being at the right place at the right time, let's right. face it. Part of it was making the right technological choices. I am a strong believer in Python, I'm a strong believer in the scientific Python stack, which really underlies uh, uh, scikit-learn. Uh, also, the, the focus has been on making things easy in the right way. So uh, we've put a huge effort on quality of the API, on quality of the documentation, and I think that's part of the success. Oh, well, absolutely, and um, any project out there has to have a, a huge community behind it, and like where it absolutely does. Um, and uh, what's the future of this wonderful project? Well, part of the future is more quality, faster models. We're not going to gain orders of magnitude, but if we can make things slightly faster, less memory usage, and that's just iterating on what we have and making it better, which is extremely important. And another part is uh, moving to larger data sets, making it easier to do out-of-core 
uh, data processing, so basically grabbing data from data sources like the disk and processing them even though they don't, they're too big to log memory. So that's going towards bigger data. Yeah, that's, that's you know, big data overnight, but hints out there, people are trying to work with it are relatively large data. So I'd call it, um, that's very interesting. Do you mind expanding on that? Because I think that'd be a, a huge interest. To well, so we are not going to go and compete with things like Hadoop and Spark right. on huge data sets because uh, uh, I believe that absolutely huge data sets will require a strong engineering base. What we would like to do is make it easier for people who do not sit in a big team with uh, uh, IT, strong IT staff, uh, strong uh, support and strong engineering uh, to, to process data that are bigger. The, the goal is really to uh, have outreach to people who don't have huge resources and empower them. Right, excellent. And, um, So, Python, phenomenal growth in Python. It's been our program back in the day. And no offense if I guess our program is going to be made at last time, but man, was that painful. Yeah. Um, but there are so many great practices out there in, in the R and the R. That's one of the reasons that it's been a huge success and one of the reasons um, people get very passionate about it because. Time, like, the learning R into packages, and uh, I kind of equate packages and libraries to like a, a jet plane. But without the engine, without these uh, libraries, it just won't fly. And um, but, uh, I've seen it myself, hugely successful in the last uh, couple of years. So, kudos to you guys for picking the right technology to start. But, um, so how much, you know, tell us a bit about your experience with Python and is this, if someone had to pick, I know your bias is on Python, but why should they pick Python over R, Julian, or something like their language? So to give you a historical perspective, I came from MATLAB, and the reason I left MATLAB is because it was domain specific, and we were doing things like controlling an experiment in an airplane, uh, so we had, you know, things that MATLAB are good at, which is data processing in air. but then we had, you know, point names, we had multi-threading issues, and MATLAB is not good at this. And so what this taught me is you start with a problem, which is, for instance, data processing, and then as, as you grow, you probably end up having to solve other problems. So why Python? Because Python is a general purpose language that is very strong and that also has the right, uh, the right feeling to do things like data processing. And that, that's why I strongly believe in Python and I don't want to do junior or R because these are the main specific languages. And um, so you're, as you mentioned earlier, you're a physicist, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the switch to data science, when did that happen? It's, it's hard to tell because I, I didn't suddenly think I'm going to do data science because I don't think the term data science existed back then. What I knew is I was interested in data processing and data business. We were acquiring data, how to go from this raw data to some understanding was the question I really enjoyed. And so I actually talked to a friend who was a statistician and he taught me a bit of statistics and I learned more statistics and then at some point I decided this is where I want to be working. I want to be working on on understanding principled data analysis, and that's why I quit physics, and I went to uh, data processing for near And um, can you speak to us a little bit about your work in general, like what excites you most about what you do? You're very, uh, you have a great background. Um, so tell us about what you're what excites you about your work. Part of my work uh, is when I. When I solve a problem in, in brain imaging, I'm not happy because I've solved a problem and it's hard, uh, so I've learned something. But I think the thing that excites me most is how do I get insight on, on how to, to go from data to solving complex questions that are ill-posed. If you're interested in, in cognitive science, the questions are very open. So you have brain imaging data. Uh, how to use this to answer cognitive science uh, questions? This is not only a data processing uh, problem, by the way, this is a wider scientific problem. But how do we build a data analytics tool that empower people to answer better those questions? That is really what I, what I really love. So Gail, you're a scientist, as you said. Um, as I mentioned earlier in our, our talk, I'm a software engineer, but I would never call myself a computer scientist, even though that's, that's what I studied, because I don't really do science. You know, we do a lot of engineering and technical stuff. Um, how can you do science and data science? 
to do science and data science, I think you have to uh, worry a lot about what 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 you're doing means, uh, because um, science, well, data science and engineering is about is about memory crunching, about prediction. Science with a capital S is about understanding. So uh, the way data science is is shifting science is by giving us more powerful models that predict better, that explain the data better. Uh, but those models, to go from, from this to new science, you need to have a way to open the black box to understand what are some form of mechanisms uh, below these models. And uh, so the, the reason this understanding is important is that we're getting more and more at doing prediction. We're, we're getting really good at doing prediction. Uh, but what we would like to do is to be able to do prescription. So to be able to uh, know what happens if you modify something in, in a given system, how the output is going to be modified. And that's not just a simple data science predictive model. Exactly, Will, it's fine. Okay, it's fine. So tell me, big question. So how are we going to make the world better with data analysis? I think that's an important question because we as, as engineers, as people doing data scientists, we're building more powerful tools and we're, we're building tools that can shape uh, the future uh, and unlike the future to be better. So uh, quite clearly uh, some place where, where data analytics can have a big impact is in making the world more efficient. So think about public transit or transportation, you know, people trying to go from point A to point B. And it's not, you know, only about me going from point A to point B. It's about many other people all trying to solve their own problem. So can we find patterns? Can we can we assemble people so that these things work better? Same thing in energy. Can I can I make your know, energy consumption better? Can I can I predict when you're gonna go home to turn on the heater or the AC just in time so that when you get home uh, your your home is at your right the right temperature. Uh, so there's going to be a lot about uh, making things more efficient. And then another thing where I'd like to see a bit more, a bit more data science is in public policy. Well, Gail, thank you so much for uh, being um, one of our rock star speakers at the Open Data Science Conference. Yeah. And um, we hope to see you again next year, for sure. Thank you very much. Well, thank you.